Once upon a time, in a university not so far away, I was teaching a class on prayer. And in it, we spent a good deal of time studying and thinking about the various images that the Bible uses to describe how God relates to our souls in the spiritual life. Not surprisingly, given how frequently it appears, the analogy of the shepherd and sheep figured prominently among them. And the class was years ago now, but I still vividly remember our discussion. This is mostly because what I thought would be a fairly tranquil affair uh, proved to be anything but. Calling a sheep is insulting, one of the early commentators opined. Think about it for a second. She continued, when we say that someone follows like a sheep, it's not a compliment. Yeah, another student chimed in, frowning. The whole image is one of helplessness and dependence. Sheep can't do anything without a shepherd. I called hesitantly on another student. Sheep are so dumb, <laughs> he said. If they don't have a shepherd, they go wandering off and all sorts of terrible things happen to them. They get hurt, and they get lost. Now, I confess that by this point, low-grade teacher panic was mounting in, in within me. I hadn't anticipated having to convince a room full of practicing Christians that the Good Shepherd was actually good news. <laughs> but it was clear that my students had understood the main contours of this analogy, right? But many of them rejected any connection to their own lives. Now, I suspect, no doubt, that they would have been comfortable um, thinking about other people like sheep, helpless, dependent, prone at least occasionally to do stupid things that have bad consequences. But they themselves? The very suggestion was apparently offensive. Just as I was beginning to pray to the Holy Spirit for a fire drill or some kind of act of God, uh, another student interjected. Dispensing with the customary hand raising, she said, wait, wait, wait. I get what you all are saying. And yes, the analogy isn't always flattering or perfect. But I think we have to remember that it's mostly meant to tell us about God. It's not all about us. <coughs> that one gets an A. <laughs> This Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter, is often called Good Shepherd Sunday. And that story comes to my mind for reasons, I think, which are obvious. It's called Good Shepherd Sunday because the gospel is always taken from the 10th chapter of St. John's Gospel, each year highlighting a different aspect of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. And indeed, as that student pointed to, the focus is first and foremost on Jesus on the shepherd and the shepherd's goodness, not on the sheep and their less than stellar attributes, shall we say. This year, the emphasis falls on the self-giving love of Christ, the one who, quote, lays down his life for the flock, the one who works for the flock to be united, one, who gathers what has been scattered, either through the negligence of a hired hand or through the menacing of a wolf, we see the Good Shepherd who, above all else, has a deeply intimate relationship with each and every individual in that flock. Now, that intimacy is exactly why the image of the Good Shepherd was on the syllabus in the class, <laughs> and why it's been so evocative throughout Christian history for the spiritual life, because it helps us put language around how God relates to us in our prayer. Teresa of Jesus understood this point very clearly and used this very image of the shepherd, the good shepherd, in her discussion in the fourth dwelling place of the interior castle. She says this, God desires in wonderful mercy to bring us back to him. A good shepherd with a whistle so gentle that even we ourselves almost fail to hear it. He makes us recognize his voice and stops us 
from going astray. He brings us back to our dwelling place. Again, the emphasis here is really on the loving shepherd, not on sheep. We are asked to focus on the God who is always beckoning to us, always inviting us deeper into prayer and contemplation. The one inviting us to our true home, found in God alone. Now, it is true, as my more skeptical students intuited, that this analogy has issues, as they would say. <laughs> it's not perfect. In fact, no analogy is. That's kind of the point, but we won't, we won't go down that path. One of the key differences between human beings and sheep is that we have intellect and that pesky thing, free will. We have a choice, in other words, to follow the good shepherd or to resist and, yes, even reject that call. Sometimes this happens in big ways, when we actively choose to do what we know is wrong or refuse to do what we know is right. Perhaps more often, our resistance is less spectacular. Earlier, I quoted Teresa speaking about that gentle shepherd's whistle, that invitation to deeper union with God in prayer. We know how easy it is to drown out that subtle, loving whisper with seemingly endless distractions and preoccupations, some of which are good in themselves. This liturgy, every time we come together, no matter where we are, stands as a reminder in the midst of our many cares that the call to deeper prayer is always there amid the noise. It is present even when we, for whatever reason, are absent. And I think we need to remember also Teresa's admonition that the call to deeper prayer must always result in deeper love, a more radical love. That our prayer, as she says, is not for our own enjoyment, but to have the strength to serve. The shepherd calls us not to be sheep or to revel in our sheepiness, but to love like the good shepherd. On this Sunday, the church asks us to pray for vocations to religious life and to ordained ministry. And indeed, as we gather this day, we pray for this community here in gratitude for being back. I, I'm, I'm grateful to be back. Um, <laughs> grateful for God's goodness in calling you and calling us together, so many of us together, around you in this place. Grateful to each of you for answering that call with good and generous hearts. You are a sign in our midst, I will presume to speak for those of you on the screen, that God is good, that the shepherd is good, and that God is always seeking to draw us deeper into loving relationship. We pray this day that the Holy Spirit will draw many more to this sacred place and to the contemplative life of Carmel. And we pray too that all of us may be given the grace, no matter our state or place in life, no matter where we are on our spiritual journey, no matter whether we are near or far, to hear the call to love like that good shepherd and to answer it with Easter joy. <laughs>